And we are back. Well, sorry about the technical difficulties, folks. It happens. We're back with another outstanding episode of the Square Table Degenerates. Today we are joined by UK rock legend, Mr. Marty Wild. How are you today, sir? Yeah, I'm pretty good, thank you. Pretty good. That's good. Yeah, we was uh, before before the show. I was calling him on WhatsApp. We, for some reason, the wrong Streamyard link was sent to Marty, so it wasn't any of our faults. It was just uh, got lost up in translation. But we're having we're rocking and rolling now, though. That's awesome. I got to meet your lovely wife, Joy. That's so cool, man. That's really cool. All right. So the internet tells me you were born a couple years ago. All right. Uh, you got the same birthday as my son, by the way. Unless your Wikipedia is incorrect, it was it four fifteen? Is that your birthday? April the fifteenth. Okay, yeah, it's tax day here in the States. That's uh, that's my son's birthday, too. He's 13. Oh, that's lovely. That's awesome, man. So it's uh, in South England. So I got to ask, when you think back, Marty, what was your earliest memory, like when you were little? When I was young, um, I, can remember, I can remember crawling up my father's chest. Um, he had an army, uh, like an army an army jumper that they supplied to the troops. And I can remember being on his chest. That's the, my earliest memory. And I can also rem remember um, kicking around in somebody's kitchen in, in a blue, it was a blue kind of like a little trolley. It was a like a little mini car, but you could move it with your legs. And I remember that as well. So that's quite, quite a long time ago. Now, were you old enough to remember any of World War II or the end of World War II? Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, I can remember a, a lot, quite a lot of it, actually. Um, the, when, uh, when the bombers used to come over, we used to watch the bombers, uh, the German bombers, and we also used to watch them, the aircraft fighting sometimes in the sky. But what happened with the bombing, it got so bad that they had to move us. But initially, they gave everybody... Uh, in London, uh, an Anderson, it was called an Anderson shelter. And it was like a corrugated steel thing, circular, semi-circular. And um, they put a little, you could have a little bed in it, like a straw bed or whatever. It was pretty basic. And a candle, there was no electricity, of course. And we, you, you, I used to go in there with my mother. When the raid was on, you would go in there with mum. And because um, father was away. And, and, and now and again, used to get shrapnel and pieces of metal come down from the sky and they would go dong you know <laughs> they'd be hitting the top of your shelter so you knew you were you know you you knew you were around all right and um you know you you knew that that there was a lot of fighting going on because it, you could hear it and also you could you were feeling it on the ground as well now did you get uh i read something you, you talked about it for a second there they relocated some youths Back then, did you, did did that happen to you at all? Did you go to like three months to the countryside or anything like that, or did you yes, oh, yeah, yeah. I was well. Eventually, um, we were everybody was sent away. I was too young to be to be sent to other people. Um, I was just too young, um, so I I, st I was lucky enough to be able to stay with my mother, um, where other children were put on a train and they were sent, you know, like a hundred miles away or sixty or seventy miles just to get them out of the bombing zone. Right. Um, uh, to the coast, a lot of them went to the coast, but uh, mum, mum used to follow my father. Uh, he was based for a while in uh, in uh, Salcombe in Devon, which is not right on the coast, which is a lovely spot. And we were based there for a short time, and then he went away again. And then uh, eventually, we moved up to North Wales, up to the as a big mountainous area, Mount Snowdon, and um, it's a very, very beautiful part of wales north wales and we lived there for about nearly three years and so i've got it we got out of that that bombing situation um but, but it was pretty hairy we, we used to watch the they used to send over these doodle bugs the v1s like a um similar to what's going over you know ukraine at the moment and uh, they when the engine cut out they would just literally die it was a, a straight straight down and so we used to watch these things, and they were—they weren't—they um, had a gyroscope inside, and that they often the damn things would go. Well, I don't know what how that works, but they would just give in. The gyroscope would say, "That's it," and down it would come. And they were really powerful. They were hugely powerful bombs, and um, I saw 
we had fl one fly right over our heads once, her mum and I, and um, she flattened me against. We were, she was taking too long at the greengrocers, and the siren had gone to warn us. And we heard this noise; you could hear it. It was like a motorbike, like a crude motorbike engine. It was a ramjet, if I remember rightly, on the top of this 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 pond, and you could hear it chortling away. And, and as we ran up the side of the, of the cinema, she flattened me against the wall with her left uh, with her left arm, and uh, this thing flew right over the top. It landed about a mile ahead, um, and in fact, we, we fell to the ground because the the shock of that uh, um, when when they when those things go off, I think the shock was, was as bad as anything. Um, it was a you know it was a tough time for for uh, for people, uh, very similar to what's happening in in Ukraine at the moment. Now, so your dad was in the service, I'm assuming at this point, right? Yes, he was. He was a sergeant in a. a uh, uh, an outfit called the Buff Regiment, and uh, for a while he was on tanks. Uh, for a while, he, uh, he, before he became a sergeant, he was on tanks. Uh, and uh, but then they moved him, and he he, be, he began to uh, train men because um, Sandhurst is a training college, and um, it's pretty pretty high level. And he so he was more useful. He couldn't. They found he had a. Uh, there was they never said, but. They said there was a physical defect. So to use to get the best out of, of my father, there was no point in sending him to Europe. And so train men, and that's what he did for the rest of the war. So I was grateful for that, you know, because otherwise Dad might have got into some of those terrible situations that uh, British and American troops uh, got into. You know, it was a tough time for everybody. Yeah, it was crazy, man. We, I've, World War II always fascinates me because I don't think we're ever going to have a war like that again. I mean, it was like the last end of all the old warfare the old style marching and stuff and then the first beginning end of the atomic age and the you know airborne warfare and stuff like that and it's uh yeah i don't think it's it's wild though it's wild to think about world war ii and all the the stuff that went on and you had families just torn apart and stuff in england we never got we never really caught much of it over here in the in the states I man we got i mean pearl harbor but other than that i mean there was no attacks on the homeland you guys got the brunt of it so i mean without england and the uk man the the U.S. wouldn't have uh, would be a whole different ball of wax. I don't know if we'd be speaking German. Probably would have figured something out, but it'd been a whole different uh, history thing there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, I mean, it, it was, you know, I mean, we we needed America desperately. Eventually, because uh, Churchill tried, you know, to 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 get the president to uh, to come into the war, but eventually, of, of course, uh, they uh, you did, and that was the difference. That was a huge difference, and eventually. Hitler is a bit like he's a bit like Putin. It's the same situation all over again. He's got the same. He's based himself on Hitler. He's got the henchmen. He pays them money. You give them big houses and look after them. Big uniforms, loads of colours, loads of medals, and you tell loads of lies. You control the radio and television. You control um, what, what what they hear and what they and what they believe. And that's exactly what's going on. It's exactly the same in in uh, in ukraine and everyone knows it you know but he um i i hope that he i, I hope that whatever happens to putin i hope it happens to him what what happened to hitler because eventually the lies caught up with him you can't you, you can't lie forever and ever and ever he'll catch up with him all right eventually it does man eventually it does now did you uh did you have any uncles or uh cause, i mean the most i mean assuming because like both my grandparents were in the service i did some time in the air force myself did uh, were pretty much all your like uncles and immediate relative, male relatives were they all, you know, in the war effort? As far as you remember? Uh, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, they would have been. Yeah, I never. I mean, I've never, to be honest with you, I've never ever checked that. Uh, but you know, they they would have been. Uh, they would have been there. Um, funny enough, I watch a lot of film films, war films myself. I was watching, uh, and I watch a lot of what uh, a, a lot of the battles and a lot of the air thing. Uh, Air incidents that took place uh, during the war with with the Americans, they had a real tough time with the bombers when they went over. They got decimated at times, you know. That, yeah. It's absolutely terrible. But never mind, you know. Courage came through in the end, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, with America and us, it's two great nations, really great. Well, it's, it's funny, man. It's funny, Marty. I watched some of those uh, the reenactments. 
you know, like when they're flying in on D-Day and stuff and they got them liberators and everything. And, you know, they're just sitting there and, and a bomb or whatever will go up in the plane. So they know the plane's going down. That just triggers like, a, oh, my goodness. I couldn't imagine trying to keep this plane up and you got all these paratroopers coming out the back. Well, you know, oh, my goodness. Yeah. It's yeah. uh it makes it makes my <laughs> it makes my war experience of sitting in the air terminal talking on the family on Skype. I and mean, it was 2011 when I was in Iraq, and I was uh, talking just I was talking just like this to the family. So uh, it's uh, it's just uh, funny how it's uh it's totally different when uh you know but it's still in the same lifetime, which is so wild to me. I mean, yeah. think about like when you, when you were little and your dad was in World War II, and then like what they're doing now, just uh just in your lifetime, the changes it has so wild to think about. <laughs> Yeah, I thought funny enough. I, I got an interest in aviation from a young a young age, a big big interest, and it's followed me right the way through. Um, we've got um, a big uh, a big a, a mu really big uh, museum up, not too far from me, about forty minutes away, uh, Duxford, uh, where you can go and see. Um, they've built a huge great. The Americans built it. You you built it. They put the money up for a huge great dome. And inside, we've got um, lots and lots of um, a great American aircraft, uh, jets and things. And uh, I, I love to go there. It really is great. Wonderful to, to see. Yeah, we got, uh, we got, there's like, uh, there's a bunch of Air Force bases over there. I know Milden Hall was a big one. I worked on mainly the cargo planes, like the C 17s and the C 5s yeah. and all that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my ball wax. And then the, the C 132. Yeah. I can't, I, I get a love hate relationship with 130s. Like they're a fun plane, but man, they, uh, just, uh, I don't know. In the war zone, you... <laughs> I've, been, I've, been in, I've been in both, but the the funniest one was I had a friend who who had um. We have a display uh, we used to have anyway. Certainly every year at Farnborough, and it was the Farnborough air display. It was very famous at one point, and um. So a friend of mine, he he knew somebody that works at Farnborough in working inside their perimeter. And he said, I could, and I said, oh, I'd love to see go to Farnborough this year. He said, I'll get you some tickets. He said, you can, you'd be able to go through, the, not the gate that everyone else goes through. He said, you go through as though you were an employee. So I said, oh, that, that would be great. He said, okay. So we fixed it up. We got in this car. We went down. We, we And then we had to change transport, get into a big old, like, coach where all the other people, and they didn't, as far as they was concerned, you know, I was a, I was a scientist or whatever. So anyway, we got in there and we got onto the tarmac and there was this um, a C-17 just parked park there. And it had just it had not long been out either. It had not been long been in service. And um, so I get to my, I said to my mate, come on, quick. Get, um, and we get, there was a queue. We got it, got in there and I couldn't get over it. And eventually, of course, with the queue, you get in the, the, the talking to the pilots inside you know which was absolutely incredible it was a brand new and i thought myself you couldn't do that now you know you wouldn't be allowed you wouldn't be allowed within 600 yards 700 yards you know oh and yeah oh yeah that's one that's know? awesome yeah when because when i was first coming in i got in in 95 and they were just phasing out the c141 star lifter and they're bringing oh, in the yeah. 17s yeah. The, the 17 was just so much easier to load because like the the 141 man 141 wasn't bad but I mean, some of these planes, like the the carrot, the, the case, the refuelers, and all that. My second base I was at was down in Columbus, Ohio. They had these KC one or KC tens, the KC ten yeah. refuelers, and that plane's a beast to load because it doesn't. It loads on the side. Most of the cargo yeah. planes load the front, and that, that was a pistol, man. I didn't like that one too much. And flying in those KC tens was ridiculous. Like the top of the because it wasn't pressurized in the cargo base, so the top would be really, really hot from the thing in the bottom would be freezing cold and then right in the middle would be just right <laughs> now, now is it true that uh you kids in the 50s used to play in the hollowed out craters and the bombs and everything from the war like yeah. I, I read i read that like you'd have you know where whatever hit and you guys just go play there and you know just how kids would do and stuff like that did you have any of that going on oh yeah you well we and where the where the bombs had knocked out houses, there would be like you'd have a street, and you'd have like um, you'd have a certain amount of houses. Then you'd have a huge gap of maybe I don't know two hundred yards, three hundred yards, and and that was where the where originally there, there would have been a house. So they would clear it, and then we used to play on the bomb bomb uh, the bomb sites. And um, yeah, I mean that's how you grew up, really. Um, you just got. It became a way of life. You didn't even think about it when I was young, to be truthful with you. 
But yes, we did. I mean, it was, um, but it was, I mean, in many ways, it was a, it was a good way to grow up because you, it toughened you up quite a lot uh, for things that were to come later, maybe in life. Not like some of the, some of the things now in, 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 uh, in Great Britain, they're very, very protective of children, which is all well and good until something, still the chips are down. And then you, you go, you're going to have to grow up very quickly. Uh, some of these kids will in the future. But um, in those days, you know, it, it was, it was just a, yeah, it was a, it was a tough time, but you just got used to it. Even, even got used to the war to a certain extent, unless you lost someone that was different. Right. When a member of the family got hurt. I think that was a different ball game. But I was blessed in so much as I didn't. I didn't lose the family like some of the people that I grew up with did. You know, it was. Um, um, so I'm grateful for that. Now, did you get into sports at any point when you were coming up? And if so, do you have a favorite? We call it soccer. Do you guys you have a favorite football team coming up? Uh, when I well, when in football, in English football, yeah, um, yeah, I used to like uh, Manchester United. Um, uh, I know I'm a southerner, but I, I got in, involved with that because I had a bad back once I was on tour and a show called Bye Bye Birdie and it was a very big show and um, I was on tour and, and uh, it played a big part in that. Well, I played a part in it. And um, anyway, my I, in dancing on the stage when I was younger, I pulled this back muscle. So they said, we're, we're going to have to operate. And I thought, oh, no. And one of the guys said, well, Send him down to, because we were in the north at the time. He said, we we're in Manchester. He says, send him down to the Manchester United ground and see what the physio says down there. So they, I went down there. The guy worked on my back every day for, for a couple of hours every day. And eventually he got that back better. And uh, so from then on in, I thought, right, my, my allegiance will be with Manchester United. So <laughs> that was it. I followed them. Um, but I like the southern teams as well. I like Arsenal. I do support Arsenal, and uh, but yeah, so uh, but I'm not. I'm, I'm more into golf than than I I have been at football, but um, that's just my 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 own personal preference. Okay, well, when did you get into golf? Was it you know when you were older? Were you always into golf? When did when did your golfing habit start? Uh, golf started for me when I was in my forties. Um, okay. You know that, so it was quite quite late late in life. Although saying that, I had lessons when I was in my twenties, but because of my career, uh, the career took over. I, I didn't have much time for sports really. I was so busy, even at weekends. Uh, but that changed, and when I was in my forties, uh, I, I started to had to learn from scratch again. And um, yeah, so I, 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 I don't play very well, but I love to watch. Um, I watched the game the the game last week. Uh, I thought it was incredible. Scheffler was was mind blowing to do what he did to come, you know, to to get, get to twice to win the same trophy. You know, was incredible. Uh, just just fun. I I look at them and I I gasp because all their iron shots are right at the flag. By and large, they are. <laughs> if I got one in a round like that, I would be over the moon. <laughs> if I if I beat whatever the the course course hole limit is for that hole, if I beat that, I consider it a good hole. Because I just, <laughs> but golfing's so fun though. I agree. I was I've been trying to get some of the some of my buddies to go golfing because it's like, ever since the pandemic, we forgot about the, just the golf culture around here, and it's fun, man. Because I smoke a lot of you know smoke a lot. We don't really drink much anymore, but I mean, just getting out in the golf cart and you're out there in nature, just having fun and hitting the ball around, and it's I really like golf. It's just such a relaxing sport. That's why it made me laugh when I was uh, setting this up and they were mentioning your golf time. I was like, ah, it's my guy right there. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's great, and it's great fun with the guys. You know, you can, um, and also I think it, it refreshes your mind in a strange kind of way because it takes your mind off of other things. If you've got uh, other things in life that have been taking up all your brain power, just for that four hours or three and a half or four hours, whatever, you're just thinking about trying to hit this silly damn ball and trying to do things with it. So it's very therapeutic, I think. Thank you. All right, now when you were uh, coming up, first listening to music, what sort of music when you were a kid or a teenager or whenever you first heard music were you like first into? Like, what were your styles, or did they even have styles back then? Well, yeah, yeah, they did. I mean, uh, there was, was a guy called Guy Mitchell, uh, American Frankie Lane. Uh, Frankie Lane was my favorite. I thought Frankie had a very powerful voice, and um, hit after hit after hit in the UK here, and uh, was a huge star. 
and Johnny Ray, another guy. But then uh, eventually over here in this country, we had a form of music called skiffle, which was like a country-based basic uh, guitar chords and and singing old American folk songs, actually. Most of them were. And um, then, uh, of course, that, I learned to play guitar when I was about 11 years of age. And so I could play it before rock and roll came in. And when rock and roll came in, um, I heard, um, you know, I had a flying start. I, I heard, um, I went to see, um, what was the film? Um, Blackboard Jungle. And Bill Haley, uh, Rock Around the Clock came on. That was the theme song as, as the, the credits came up. And it blew me away. I just, the rhythm was fantastic. I wasn't a big fan of Haley's. But although he was very talented, but I wasn't a fan of that style of singing. But the rhythm attracted me, and I thought, "Oh wow!" And of course, then then Elvis, and and Elvis was the Elvis was the game changer for for me and for thousands of other other singers. You know, at that point in America and in Great Britain, right around the world, you know, uh, there were clones, or we we tried to sing like him, or you know, dress like him, or you know, and and these albums in, uh, in those Sundays that were quite staggering. The the first album he ever made, the Sun album, was a was a, an incredible album. Now let's get into Elvis. What was your when you first heard Elvis? Was it uh, what? Do you remember approximately what year we were talking here? Because he came out here, and I mean, like back then, I would assume you, you had to listen to it on the radio. Was there like a rock station out of London or something? How did you guys get the early things, or was it just records or? Yeah, we we had a we we, the, we had a station called Caroline, which was a boat, which was uh, it could operate just outside English waters and could then send the radio waves with all the, the sound across to us. And it was a that was a godsend because it was playing all American, uh, mostly American hits and, and, and British hits as well. But that's where I first heard Elvis singing "Heartbreak Hotel," and um, I couldn't. I didn't think much, I couldn't, I just thought, didn't think a great deal about it. I liked the idea of it, but didn't think a great deal. But then a mate of mine, he had Elvis Presley, the very first album, uh, which I've still got. And uh, and he, he said, uh, you know, he, he said, I don't want this album. Do you want it? I said, well, I said, Elvis, I, I said, I'm not sure. He said, look, it's only 17 and 6, you know, which was peanuts in those days. But, and I said, okay, I'll buy it. And that that once I heard the sun sound with um, um, with Scotty Moore and DJ Fontana and uh, and Bill Black, that was the game changer. That changed my my whole life really because I love those tracks. Um, they were they were earthy tracks, and Elvis at that point um, was right on the money. You know, he, he, and his voice was was quite staggering. I thought in, in many ways it appealed to me. And you know, that's the truth of it. So, and to lots of others. So that was the way I, I first heard him. Now, when you first heard that, did you first start performing then after you heard that kind of music or when did you get into like performing? And, and back then, did you like just kind of hear something and then cover it or did you write songs? Yeah. Did you, how did that kind of stuff work? Yeah, I was signed and then they didn't, we didn't have a, we didn't have English guys the blues and and rock and roll uh, style music songs weren't really being written. Uh, there was only maybe one guy in the whole of Great Britain who could write anywhere near rock and roll. Most of them were very twee, very old fashioned. They had no, you know, they didn't, you know, I always say uh, we didn't have Beale Street, you know, we had, we had Shaftesbury Avenue, you know, which was, you know, like the top of hats and, and, and old cars, you know, so, we didn't have that influence uh, that, that you, you you Americans had, and we had to catch, try and catch up very quick, which some of us did. Some of us did caught up, and um, so when I first started, a I couldn't get, I couldn't use my band; they wouldn't let me, and that was a tragedy. And so I had to use session musicians, and they were old jazz musicians, great guys, great musicians, but they just played in a very old-fashioned twee way. And um, that, so that's that first early British records, rock and roll ones, were, were, were they weren't they weren't really hard. The, and now and again, if you've got a good sound, it was pure luck. You know, if you've got something that even I had a record I covered "End of Sleep," which was Jody Reynolds uh, in your country, um, and, but I covered it and I got the hit with it. But and the sound I got was freakish, 
it was because it was just one of those days where the guitar he had and the echo and everything was dead right for the song. And my approach was slightly different to Jody's. Although it was his song, I, I made it far more, um, I don't know, a bit more dramatic. And that was the sort of stuff I'd learned from, from people like Frankie Lane, who was a very dramatic singer, Jezebel and all those great songs. So, um, yeah, but it was, you know, we, we did, we would, we tried to catch up as quick as we could, but there was so much to learn. And then, of course, as time went on, you had the Beatles who had the, the that they were, uh, the, the Beatles lived in, uh, were all based in Liverpool. And when they, they were lucky because the seafarers used to come in, the sailors, and they would bring in American tracks. They would bring albums directly, you know, from America and say, hey, cop this. And they were, so the Beatles were getting the, the great influences with black music. And, um, and then later, um, you, obviously, you've got the Stone, you know, that's about the same time the Stones, who were all blues, you know, that was, that was what they wanted. And uh, so things started to change. Uh, things started to change, um, but it, it, it took time. And it, I was sort of, um, although I was one of the early pioneers, you might say, of, of rock and roll, it, it was, um, you know, I, 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 I was trying to learn as quick as I could and understand what I was hearing. Uh, but it, it took it took a little bit of time, and the Beatles learned off my, off of people like me, and the Stones learned off of you know what I mean. That it's, that's an ongoing thing, which is natural. But um, but I, I enjoyed it. I loved it. I mean, I used to I used to love all those those early tracks. I used to love it. I still listen a lot to to early rock and roll, and I was listening to a group called the Prisoners uh, today, an old track called Walking in the Rain. Well, you probably haven't heard it. I don't know if you heard it. But no, I've never heard that. Well, That's the prisoners were a black group, and uh, they they sung this song, Walking in the Rain. And then a few years later, of course, um, uh, uh, Johnny Ray recorded it. It was number one around the world. Uh, um, and uh, he, he recorded that. And then also there was another song called Fever. Do you remember Fever? Peggy Lee had, it, had a hit with it. And that was originally a black record, and that, that was a great record. So some of those early blues uh, tracks I like, um, as well as, as rock and roll. No, no question about it. Oh, I love some of those old blues ones, because I, I got hip to some of them, you know, when I was coming up, like Nirvana would sing some of the Lead Belly songs and stuff like that. Yeah. And that My Girl, oh, My Girl, oh, that's a great, great class. I just love some of that, them riffs that bring it back, man, that's great. Now, when you were first discovered in 57 or, or so, where were you at mentally? Did you think you were going to be like make a career out of this? Did you think you were going to have to go to college or the service or something? What was your, where were you at mentally in terms of your career at that point? I, I didn't think a great deal about it, to be honest with you. I, I didn't think a great bit. I just, I just forged ahead. I just wanted to, I wanted to be in music. I just love music and I still do. It's been the biggest, one of the biggest, the biggest things in my life, uh, apart from my family. And um, so I want to do, yeah, I wanted I wanted to be in music, and so I just carried on and carried on. I've done that probably all my life, and you know you've got to and now and again you get knocked back. You know, you things go wrong, or but by and large you just keep going. So I did, and I didn't have any. Uh, I I must have had obviously determination, and I, I certainly had a little bit of confidence when I I was a shy guy, but once I got on the microphone. Uh, then it changed, and I, I was I, I that was my area. I, I could I could handle that. Okay. Now, what was uh, life like in the early years? Were you traveling throughout the entire UK? Did you go international? What was your first couple of years in the business like? Um, yeah, mostly. Yeah, didn't play much abroad. I came to America uh, briefly. Did the Dick Clark show, um, which was a big TV show then. Um, you know, and met met many of the of the big artists of the time, the Johnny Johnny Cash. You know, I went to Johnny's home, Johnny Cash's house, spent a day with him and his family. Um, oh, nice! I saw the Johnny Cash Museum down in Nashville. That's a if you're out if you're ever in the states, anybody go visit the Johnny Cash Museum. It's really cool. He was in the Air Force too, and they had a he has a YouTube plaque right up front for those of you who are into YouTube. He has it was awarded posthumously, obviously, because he's passed away, but. For, for Johnny Cash, for passing a million YouTube subscribers, is right in the front of the museum. It made me laugh. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's lovely. He deserves it. I mean, he was 
I mean, he came over to England, and we were we worked together on a TV show uh, uh, called Boy Meets Girls, and um, it was a very big TV show. It came on at the weekend, and I was the the host of it. I used to introduce and sing on on the show, but he, um, yeah, he was a <laughs> he was. I always remember the very first time I ever met him because we, we were told in advance of the artists that would be coming over. And we're, we're, like, I was told that Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent were coming over and people like that. And also with Johnny Cash, and they said Johnny would be coming. So eventually, you know, you get on with your work. And then suddenly one day in the in the studio, there was this tall man coming for, towards me. He walked a little bit like John Wayne, very slow, very quite deliberate. And with, in a black, black shirt, I remember, and a black pants. And the belt as well, which was like a Western belt. If the whole image was... Was what was Johnny Cash, and I, I, I was blown away. I thought, well, this is going to be great, and it was. You know, a lovely man, lovely man. That's awesome. Now, when you first started, did you realize you were like considered a teen heartthrob? Kind of, you know, I don't, I don't know if they even they had the word boy band back then, but you know, you, you get what I'm what I'm uh, throwing yeah. out. Did you realize that was the thing, or did you just kind of still forge ahead how you were doing it? Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was just, I didn't, I mean, I never took the, that side of it too seriously. I, I thought, you know, I didn't know how long it would last. I'd every, I didn't really give that a thought. And I didn't really take that. For me, it was making music. If, if they were going to scream, they scream. But if they didn't, okay, they don't. I just, I'll just play on. And I think um, I used to smile sometimes. And I, and I was looking at, uh, sometimes you see the clips of Elvis. And Elvis smile used to smile as well in the middle of his stage act. He sing a very serious, you know, like a rock and roll ballad or something. But then he look he look at the audience and give a smile, and he knew, you know, don't take you, you can't take those things too seriously. You go mad if you did. <laughs> now was back then was, I mean, I wasn't alive in the fifties. So I don't know. I've only seen what I've heard in movies and in pop culture and all that. But was like the Elvis hip shaking thing. Was that any kind of big deal over in the UK? Or you guys are just like whatever. We don't care. Oh no no no! The movement was a, was an essential part. The movement was an essential part because the, the more you moved, I mean, Elvis started all that. Well, he didn't start off; he just got it from black artists anyway. But you know, and um, he, he once we once you started moving, then the girls would scream. So he just moved a bit more, and they would scream a bit more. But uh, again, it was like something you. It was just like it was a passing phase. But it was it was good fun at the time. <laughs> oh, for sure. Now, if I said, "Hey, Marty, what American fifties pop sensation would you most, most compare yourself to?" Who would you pick? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, that is a tough one. Uh, well, I don't know really. Um, it's hard because I didn't fit in one slot totally in one slot or another. Um, no, it's hard. I couldn't. I couldn't really do that. It was kind of a cross between someone like a Presley type singer and and a Dion. You know, Dion. I love Dion. Oh, Dion. Love Dion. I listen to Dion. So there's this song he has called "The Wanderer," and yeah. I, that's, that's in my regular playlist. I love that song. I don't know what it is about that song. It's such a banger, man. I, I love, love it. Dion. <laughs> yeah, you just reminded me. I said to my band, and I wanted to put. I want to put that in the act because it's such a rouser. It's such a great one, and um. And funny enough, I, I, I wrote, wrote a song called uh, in the, for about four years ago, uh, which was quite popular here, called uh, Running Together. And um, uh, I took a little bit of the Wanderer inspiration in, uh, in on that song. And you can hear a little bit, um, a little bit of it, in a tiny bit of the Wanderer idea in the song. But yeah, what the Wanderer is a great song. And Dion's a great singer anyway, just a fabulous singer. No, for sure. All right, describe your life in the 60s. Were you just like a typical family man? Did you have like Austin style, Austin Power style parties? What was your your 60s thing going on there? I was I was pretty quiet, to be honest with you. I was pretty quiet. And I'm glad I was. I'm glad I I wanted a I wanted to get married, which I did, and I wanted a family. Uh, and I'm glad. I mean, I would never have changed that enough of the world. Um because I wouldn't like to have gone, wouldn't like to have been solo and single all those years. I think you go you'd probably go mad. I mean, not long ago, um, uh, my, my daughter Kim Wilde, she she toured with Michael Jackson, and and, and my wife and I travelled with Kim. Uh, obviously, around the band and everybody, we all travelled, and so I used to watch Michael Jackson fairly close. She couldn't get close to him, 
but you could watch him from, you know, like 20 yards away, 30 yards away, coming on stage. I used to watch him go on stage. And I thought to myself, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like that kind of world, not, not for anyone in my family. I would never like to be that big. Um, I think it, uh, you kind of, if you're not careful, you're going to miss out on really essential things in life because you're not, it's not natural. It's not natural to be loved all the time like that. You know, no one's damn, no one's damn perfect. You make mistakes and you, you know, although, I mean, I, I thought Jackson's stage show was mind blowing. I've never oh, seen yeah. another, apart from Beyonce. Beyonce is the other one. Beyonce is the other one who's got that, that one in a million voice and one million million style. But well, that's he, weird to think about though. Like fame does become a curse after a while. Like you don't want to become too famous. Uh, you know, you, I mean, you want to make enough money to support your family and live an okay lifestyle. But you, you, I mean, you think of that level. I mean, imagine going out of your house and you can't even do anything because there's people taking pictures. Hey, Joe, Joe, what? I, hey, my goodness, that sounds like prison, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, you imagine, you know, Michael Jackson. He, um, he just couldn't go out anywhere. You know, really, he was. He had. He was well, well protected. Big, big, uh, loads of loads of bouncers, loads of people. And, and was putting on these incredible shows. But I thought, you know, I thought, well, you know, I, I, I've been to, uh, um, I've been to, to, to shows when I was first starting. And you'd, you'd be played to a packed house and you'd go, you've got all the girls are screaming and everything. And then, you know, I used to end up in a hotel virtually on my own, um, just, you know, sitting there looking out the window because you couldn't really get out. And that's crazy. You know, that's, that's, that's not what life's all about. <laughs> it's funny you say stuff like that. Cause like I'm a stand up comic by, by nature. I had this YouTube thing kind of is what I do to do for fun. Cause it's, I, I got a family and a regular job you know, I got to do my thing, but like with stand up with comedy, it's kind of the exact opposite. Like I'll wait for after shows, we'll hang out, you know, we'll go in the back and smoke, you know, chill, whatever. And it's, it's like uh, it's so much different dynamic. I never thought about it like that. It's wild. Yeah, just sitting in those because I mean I, re I read about like a lot of athletes, like guys like Ronaldo or LeBron, whoever's on the road or whatever. You know, they'll go in the rooms and they play video games all the time because they can't do anything. You know, because no, somebody's gonna no, no, do something to them. It's crazy. That's right. You, you get that big. It's almost a curse, you know, in a way. Unless you can, unless you can divorce yourself from it completely, which I'm sure some people can. You know, um, but I think one of the uh, um, one of the things it's which Michael Jackson, people like that, and Beyonce are exceptional. But a lot of artists have huge fame, obviously, and then it starts to go down, it starts to wilt, and um, that happens to I'd say about eighty percent, eighty-five percent of artists. It just starts to calm down a bit, and I think that's very hard for some of those artists to take. They can't quite understand that. You know, wow! You know, I was I was big ones. You know, and but if you, I, I never thought I I just I just continued to work. You know, I just I, and I have done right up to this point. You know, I'm still writing. I write songs, and and that's my great my uh, great you know uh, joy is to be able to write songs still and really enjoy it. I love I love um and I love music. You know, a very eclectic selection of music. Um, you know, from classical to you name it. Um, oh, Taylor Swift, Beyonce, um, and then coming down the Rolling Stones and Paul Simon goes on and on and on. Folks, uh, Fleetwood Mac, I love Fleetwood Mac. So, you know, I, I'm a lucky man. I, I love them all. <laughs> yeah, you no, know, at, at any point, and this is just a random question, because you, live you lived in London during the huge scooter days. Did you ever own a Vespa at any point in your life? Own a what? A Vespa, a scooter. Yeah, did yeah, yeah. Okay. You mean powered by per petrol or or? Yeah, powered by petrol, just a regular yeah. scooter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. my my buddies make fun of me because I I got one and I, I I I laid it down a couple years ago, like it flattened. I was I was braking and I, I wasn't paying attention, and then oh, and it messed my arm up, and I still ain't got the damn thing fixed. So I gotta I gotta get some motivation because that's still a good bike. I still ain't got my motorcycle license either, though. I gotta go. <laughs> so it was probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. They, it's like oh, anything like that, you know. Unless it's got a seatbelt, it's going to be pretty dangerous. I tell you. <laughs> now, when the Beatles first came out, were you thinking that was cool? Like they were an awesome progression of the of the line of rock and roll. The the, the crescendo it was going. I mean, obviously, you didn't at the time probably realize how big they were going to be 
you know, overall, but like, what was your first impression of that group coming out? And like, did you vibe with them? Did you, you know? Well, I, I, well I'd worked Liverpool in, for example, one year, I did four separate shows at a venue um, uh, called the Liverpool Empire, a big theater, holds about three or 4,000 or 5,000. And I did it, I went there four times. And each time I did, there was a guy up there in, in, in Liverpool telling me all about this new group, the Beatles. And he used to have these little booklets with John Lennon and was all in medallions and leather jackets, and they were quite scruffy to me. And um, so I, I was aware of them. They were there. And then um, uh, the next show, he came up again, and obviously, you know, he was there, said, oh, the Beatles, they're, they're going to fa be fantastic and all this. And it, this went on. And then around about, uh, then about six months, seven months or whatever it was, or a year, could have been a year later, I was up in another part of uh, near Liverpool, but around about 100 miles away. And um, I, I went, I played a ballroom, and these teenagers came up and they said, Oh my God, have you seen the Beatles? And I said, Well, yeah, I have heard of them. I said, I definitely heard of them. I said, Are they? They said they are fantastic. They are incredible. So, anyway, that was one. I went to another venue around about three months later, same thing. And I thought, They're destined for something. There's no question about it. So anyway, um, then I, I read the the, 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 uh, the new song was going to come out, "Love Me Do," and so and I said to I said to all the people around me, I said, "Watch out for this record." I said they didn't know who the Beatles were. They they didn't. I said, "But watch out." They're called the Beatles. Love Me Do, because I said if my hunch is right, they are going to be big. They're going to be big and very quick. And sure enough, thankfully my judgment was right, and um, and I, I loved them. I did. I love their. But because they were, they were songwriters. They were good, very natural melodic men. Uh, the pair of them and John Lennon. Um, you know, when you I was listening to Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and and Across the Universe. You know, this man was. You know, and Paul. You know, the Long and Winding Road. And these guys were, these guys were on a, on another world. And um, and and also, I mean, I remember Paul Simon saying he was so impressed with them. Um, there was one of the tracks where um, I, I am a war, so it could have been I am a war or so, no, no, it was Strawberry Fields Forever. And at the end of it, you hear this like chugging away the rhythm. And he took a little bit of that for one of his songs, just the rhythm idea. So in other words, if Paul Simon is going to listen to two of our guys and and take, a, you know what I mean, a bit, a, a bit to nick something or, to, or be influenced, then they had to be pretty good. Now, have you ever met any of the four? Yes, yes, I've met all four. I met all. I'm very early on in their career. Um, I met. Uh, in fact, I, I said the wrong thing because at the time, I didn't know who sang what. You couldn't always tell, and I I hadn't bought any of their their albums or anything. And I I said to Lennon that I like one of the songs that he sang, and he wasn't too pleased because he said that Paul that was Paul's voice, you know. So. I, it wasn't a good start, but they were, you know, they were young guys and they were really enjoying life. And, and I met um, uh, Paul later. Uh, my wife and I went to to one of the, um, just trying to think, it was one of the rock and roll shows with Carl Perkins, actually. It was Carl Perkins because Paul loved Carl Perkins. And so, mind you, so did George Harrison. And um, they both loved Carl Perkins. And uh, at the at the show um, afterwards, you could, you, could, um, you know, we were meeting, and in fact, um, Paul said he he reminded me of a show at that those four shows at the Liverpool Empire. He'd been to one, and he told me of the, one of the gags that I pulled because I used to pull a gag on on the stage. I say, ladies and gentlemen, who is greatly honoured this this evening, we have here, ladies and gentlemen, would you please stand for the president? And now they stood; the whole audience would stand, and then I used to say of United Dairies, because there is a president of United Dairies. <laughs> and, of course, the Paul reminded me of that, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, uh, and then, of course, they, you know, they, they heard my, my records and stuff like that. But they, they were uh, um, very creative, very influential, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad they were, glad that they were in this world. All right, if I was to add, this is a question we ask every guest. If I was to ask you, Beatles or Queen, are those two groups? Who would you pick? Beatles, but uh, well, saying that you've picked on two of my 
Probably the Beatles because I heard them first. Uh, if Queen had come first, maybe that would be different because I loved Queen. But if you look at the volume of the songs that the Beatles wrote, it, it, it's mind blowing. You know, it was song after song after song. Queen were far more sophisticated. They were they were a later generation, uh, and and they were there was there was more. I would say they were more intelligent, probably in in many many areas. And certainly their music was was very very uh, uh, was, was very professional and, and very almost semi classical in, in in its style. So I love them and I love Freddie. Freddie the I thought Freddie was a stunning singer. I mean I love I love the their their, their live album which were at Wembley in in the UK and um and uh, and they go dang a 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 oh boy and the crowd are all jumping you know that that's um you know but there again I've got to think of I am a walrus Lucy in the sky with diamonds she's home you know all those great Beatles some of the Paul songs and and um yesterday and oh it goes on forever. Heck yeah. All right, describe some of the early UK TV shows you were on people may or may not remember because, I mean, obviously, I wasn't uh, – I mean, I, unless I asked my friends, I don't know what shows were even on there. And did you guys have, like, an equivalent to Ed Sullivan's show over there? Oh, uh, well, no, we had – our teenage shows, we had um, we had a one six five special. That was a very twee show that was out in the mid-50s onwards up until about 57, 58. But then it moved on, and we did a show, great show called the Oh Boy Show, um, which wasn't wasn't really like it was. Put it this way, it was it was miles better than the Dick Clark Show. The Dick Clark Show was just miming. Our show was live, but a big orchestra, and um, the band were pretty good. They were they weren't bad. A bit bit twee at parts maybe, but they were a big band playing rock and roll, and that doesn't always work. But the uh, artists and that were singing live, which is. Very important to, for a, for a singer, um, and then uh, so we didn't we didn't really have an, like an Ed Sullivan show. Um, uh, I wish we had in a way, but but we no, it wasn't wasn't quite like that. But we did have our shows were for pop. We're at pop times, what I call pop times, like which is six o'clock early, not not late evening. You know, in Great Britain, they'd have been watching a play or something. You know, they. You were lucky, you know, you had, you had Ed Sullivan. We'd be watching a play or something, or some boring serial, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's funny. At what, at what point did you realize your children were beginning into the music? Oh, I never thought about that either. I never thought. I just know when I was young, uh, when they were growing up in this house, um, Kim and Ricky in particular, I've got four. And the first two children came. There was a space before we had our second two. But with Kim and Ricky um, in the house, I instead of most people had these smaller speakers, um, you know, they'd be a bit like, I don't know, a foot high, foot wide, and, and on their little hi-fi sets. I had Wharfdale speakers, and they were about, oh, they were about four feet, four and a half feet high, wide, great bass, great treble. So every time something would come in, like the Who um, or, or the Beatles or, or Elvis or whatever, uh, it was always full bass, full top. And that was, they were hearing this all the time. And again, because of my, because of my involvement with music, um, they were hearing things uh, like uh, there was a track came out called the Autobahn which was one of the very first synthesizer tracks that ever came out, came from Europe. I think it came from Germany. And um, that they were listening to all these kind of, and then I'd play classical. I'd play Chopin or I'd play uh, Tchaikovsky, one of my favorites, or Bernstein. And so they, this big separate, always full bass, full top, and particularly rock and roll, of course. So they were, this influence was in them all the time. They were they were lucky. I wish I'd had that when I was a child. You know that kind of rock and roll thing. And um, but but of course you couldn't. Things had to progress slowly. You know. Classically, I, I like I I love uh, John Philip Sousa. It's probably my favorite classical because Stars and Stripes Forever. I'm I, I love the national anthem. Don't get me wrong, but Stars and Stripes Forever. Yeah, that's a banger. That's a really. Da, 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 da. Oh, that's a good song. Oh, I love that. <laughs> And then they come in with the five part and the five solo. Oh, that's the best part of any song ever, I think. 
It's so well, and, it, and it stirs the heart as well. It, makes it you does. It does. It's beautiful. I right, yeah. got a couple questions from the uh, audience here. It says, Jimmy or Stevie Ray, who was a better guitar player in your opinion? Oh, again, no, um, I wouldn't like to say on that. Maybe Stevie Ray. I don't know. It's so close. It's not true. For sure. All right. And what is your favorite rap group? I don't have one. I don't. I don't. I treat rap as poetry, and so if I hear a rap, you know, I I, I can't say I have a favorite. I sometimes you'll hear a rap song that will grab you because it again it's poetry for me. If it's got you know, I don't know. They take out, they sample out different things, which America does it, you know, an awful lot, and that's great. I mean, if that's that going to get get your rap uh, listen listen to, so. But I don't treat, I don't look look down upon it at all. I, I treat it as an art form, uh, particularly if it's done well, and if it's really hit the spot on a social need of someone or what they feel, what the country really feels. That I kind of figure that's 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 damn important. That's as important almost as any politician. That's for oh, for sure, for sure. You can get a lot. A lot of political messages can be conveyed through music, like very yeah. subtly or sometimes overtly. It, it makes it makes a difference in this world. It really does. Yeah, I agree. Right. Now, what was your the first car you owned, and what was the favorite car you ever owned? Say again. What was the first car you ever owned, and what oh, was the, my the favorite favorite car oh. you ever owned? Oh well, I mean, you, we're talking about British cars. They they were appalling. I mean, they were. I can tell you my my first American car. I had I started off with it. I can tell you the first one. Hold on, it was an Austin Austin A five or something. It was terrible. It always broke down. But my big joy came. I had a I had a Ford Sunliner, which was a killer. Made in Canada, uh, right hand drive, so it was okay for the UK roads. But it was it was the Ford Sunliner, and it had these big fins at the back, and it was the most. It was so in advance of, of anything over here because we had power brakes, um, uh, we had a stereo radio or something like that. We had. A seat belt, which one just a little belt, but it was a seat belt nevertheless, and an electric hood, all these things. And I was driving around in that in 1960, and it was one of my favorite all time cars, I tell you. And I've had since I've had Jaggies, uh, Jaguar E's, and and um, um, and, and I, I, I do like Mercedes very much. I'm a Mercedes man, but um, yeah, that I think. The first car, an awful Austin car. They were terrible. They were, and I'll tell you what, they, you got a smile. The indicator, when you wanted to turn right or left, you had a knob in the center of the fascia in the front, and you twiddled it, and then the thing came out. You know, the, the flipper would come out, an orange flipper. You flip it back if you were going the other way. Oh, it was so basic, but <laughs> it worked, you know, it worked. That's so funny. I, it's, it's funny because, like, even now, like I go to the UK now, and there, it's uh, I mean, because obvious reasons, the, the right hand versus left hand drive thing is uh, the big one. But yeah, you hear car brands. It's like this is I've never heard of this brand before in my entire life. Like before I went to the, I mean, I heard of Fiat's like in Spanish class, and that was it. And I go to Europe, and they're everywhere. You know, this is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, some of the, you know, some of the uh, some some years ago, uh, I bought um, a little sports car. Uh, which was made by Honda, and um, it was some car, rear engine. That was a special car. So yeah, things sometimes, sometimes the continentals or another, the foreign countries come up with with something really special. Um, yeah. But you know, I mean, there is there again. I mean, you know, now it's the days of pet Tesla. Uh, I don't own a Tesla because I'm scared. Um, we haven't got the charging points that you've got in America, not really. So. It's, it's like I'm gonna wait and see, and I'm I'm getting too old to buy a Tesla now. But uh, <laughs> Tesla's a, a a great machine. I've heard everyone talks uh, very well about it. Yeah, and I see a couple of Teslas drive around here because, like, North of me is a pretty rich suburb, so we see every now and then. But I don't know. Yeah, the infrastructure grid is gonna really need some upgrades if we're gonna wanna get all the Teslas in that bad boy. All right, now have you ever been, or when was the last time you were at the Isle of Man? Have you ever been there for the TT? Uh, no. No, I haven't. No, I've been to the Isle of Man, but that was definitely that was for a show. No, not not for the TT. No, not for the TT races. No. Okay. Uh, what was your you, when you went to America? Did you have a favorite place in America? Oh yeah, uh, I would say 
I would say I've got to be, I know it's Cornwall, but California, I like California. I like warm weather. And, um, you know, I, I, I went over there and I, I loved it, you know. And, and Johnny Cash's home, that was, I can't remember, it was that was around the Californian area. And um, that was that was a lovely area. It was a bungalow, a big, long bungalow. And that kind of, I love the, the warmth, the weather. Uh, the weather really attracted me. If I could have had a, um, uh, a hits in America, I would, I would go for the warm parts without a shadow of being. I mean, I've been to New York, um, obviously New York, great city, uh, but, but I'm not a city man. Although it's, you know, it's a, um, uh, although it's New York is a, reminds me in a funny kind of way of London because it, it's a name, it's a fantastic name, and it lives up to that name. You know, London does in its own way. It's very British, but it's London, and so does New York. But Give me the warmth. Give me uh, Arizona, uh, probably Arizona, where all the golf clubs are. Uh, and I went to uh, a few uh, just a couple of years ago. I went to to see um, um, a golf that saw uh, Tiger Woods win um, uh, the Masters, and, and that was truly, truly incredible. That was that was one of the highlights of my sporting life to see that man win again, and to 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 be out there. It was a wonderful. I've got. Because with the, you get a little seat, you can hire a little seat when you're out there, a little fold-up thing, and I've still got that, and I keep that with warm affection to remind me. My son took me; we flew over there, and um, it was oh, it was it was it was wonderful, wonderful. Augusta, yeah, the Masters. What, what it, now? That's a good random question. If you could play one golf course in the entire world, what would it be? Mine, mine would be Pebble Beach. I've always, Pebble Beach just looks spectacular. I'd love to play there. What would you pick? I would, oh, I don't know. I would probably go, I would probably go, or played on, and it was a nice course in Disneyland, one of the courses there. But they, they were very good. But having seen Augusta, I mean, a, a God almighty. I mean, standing on that first tee, looking down the fairway, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I could even hit the ball. Because it's, uh, it's quite awesome. You don't realise how big it is. It's a massive area. Uh, um, my golf club, which I belong to, is is big, you know. But you can get round there in about you know th three and a half hours, three if you're two, two and three quarters if you really go far. You couldn't do that at Augusta. It's massive. And my son, when um when we were we were over there, he got me a seat on the sixteenth, sixteenth, uh, 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 just opposite where the tee was, par three. And then when we watched Tiger, he nearly held that, you know, but he got a two there, and but. That and so I sat there looking down, viewing all this, and I thought, yeah. And I said to Marty, I said, look, son, you. He said, I'm going to walk with Tiger. Should we walk with Tiger up the 17th? I said, no. I said, I'm going to walk straight straight up now to the 18th. You, I, I couldn't do it. I was so tired. It, as I say, it's a, a big course, but absolutely wonderful. That's awesome. All right, now the I got to ask you about this cover for this album. Or it's this is uh this picture is that you when you is that a picture of you? Let me ask you that. Yeah, that that's me when I was about about four or five, and I got my father's army hat on, his army bag or one of his army bags there, and a walking stick for a gun, and it was it was taken. Someone took the picture in Devon, in the south the south of England, uh, near Salcombe, a beautiful and a lovely area, and uh, yeah, that was taken there. Okay. It says that, let me read the, the press release and I'll ask you a couple questions about it. It says, uh, two eyes streaming comes out on 19th of April as you celebrate your 85th birthday the same week. It says Marty realizes the single from the new EP of the same two eyes streaming. The EP is released simultaneously the same day. Now, is this your, you're going to have a tour company with this. Is this your first time touring uh, since the pandemic or have you been touring the whole time or what's the deal there? No, touring all the time. I've been okay. on tour. Yeah, I've toured my whole life. Um, and I'm, yeah, it's been one of the one of the joys, really, to to be able to do it. You know, it's. Uh, I mean, like most people they will do now. Like when you talk about in terms of an English or an American tour, the big rock bands. You know, they they will tour for a certain period, and that is it. You know, but um, <laughs> I, I'm I'm lucky to you know to be able to, my 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 gigs are sort of spread out. You know, I'll be you know I have a week off, and then I'll have two shows, and then. You know, then one show, then a two weeks off or whatever. So it's spread out right the way through the year. Uh, I've done. I mean, normally I, I used to do in the, uh, you know up until about three years ago, until I was I, I think my last tour was about three years ago, 
Um, but, uh, you know, I started to feel it, really, because, uh, uh, you, and uh, I mean, at one time, I had to do five shows on, uh, one, five shows after, one after the other, and, you know, when you're singing for two hours, and you're driving, which I do, and you're 81, which, or whatever I was, and 82, it, it, I thought, I'm never going to do it. I managed to do it, but now I like to uh, take it easy, you know, I just, just if I can spread it out, then I can handle it. Now, do you get to, do you have a bus that goes with you? Do you get driven there? Do you fly? How do you get to all the tour, tour dates? I, I drive in a Mercedes 5-litre, 5-litre, uh, uh, white Mercedes, five, five, an incredible engine, a mind-blower. But that, there again, there is, I, don't, I, I know in America you've got restrictions. I couldn't believe that, 50 mile an hour. That, was, that would drive me bonkers. But uh, we, can, we can do up to 70, but obviously... Uh, Sometimes, you know, not so much lately, but in the old days, uh, you know, you were coming home, you could do 100, you could do 130 in certain areas. But it's, you know, I, I don't do that anymore. I, I, I'm, I've calmed down as a, as a driver. But, I was always the opinion, once you hit like 60, you retire, you should be able to drive whatever your age is. So if you're like 75, you can go 75 miles an hour. If you're 88, you can go 88 miles an hour. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Well, 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 I mean, one of the funniest journeys, that strangest journey I ever had, uh, we, we went over to, we got over to Europe and we, we went, we were going to Luxembourg and the, uh, the, on the road to Luxembourg, there was this huge long dry, uh, dual carriageway, which went on for mile after mile after mile. And um, I was doing, I just put this thing and I set it on 130 and, and that was it. I was doing 130 nearly all the way which was a bit crazy, but never mind. Uh, but um, there we go. I don't, as I say, I'm a good boy now. <laughs> I still, I mean, I try to keep up with traffic. I get, it's, we got a lot of construction going on right by the house now, Marty. So it's like when I'm, when I'm, when I'm coming up the, there's a street called Lorraine. When I'm coming up Lorraine going to Walter Road. There's always somebody going like 28 miles an hour in the 35 zone. And in America, if you're in a 35, everybody knows you got to go 40. So this is like, it's really an irritant. And as a life kind of calming down thing, I'm learning if I can not get mad at that situation and I could just deal with anything. So I'm learning, I'm trying to, you know, not just cuss and everything else when I'm stuck behind somebody who's going 28 and a 35, even though it's such a life irritant. It's a <laughs> well, funny you say that. I got done for speeding about a year and a half ago. And um, you can, instead of having a fine, you can, you can have, a, they'll, they they teach you. They'll they'll have a, somebody teach you take the test, uh, not a test, but it's, they'll teach you uh, how safe driving. And um, so I I decided I would take this, uh, the the coaching at how to drive decently and sensibly, and um, and I took it and I've learned such a lot. And exactly what he was saying was what you're saying there. If you get behind someone, take it easy. He said if you go that much faster and you arrive, he said most of the time, what are you going to do? Knock off twenty minutes. Of, of, you know, taking a risk. He said, what was the point? What are you going to do in that 20 minutes? It was, it's that important, you know. <laughs> so, and and it, so it changed me. It did. And, but we, one of the hardest things is, uh, I hope it doesn't happen. I don't know if it happens in America. In London, the mayor of London has put the uh, speed limit in, in the centre of London at 20 mile an hour. Oh. Hell. It is absolute hell. Because you can't, I've got a five litre car. You know, driving at that speed is it's it, it's an irritant, and it's driving everybody mad. But that's what's happening in London at the moment. Well, so. my street right here is twenty five. You can usually go about 30, 32, 35 ish, and they're not going to mess with you. But there is a school right over here, so that that speed limit's twenty. But with the school zone, it's not too bad because you know you're going through it and it's going to end. But yeah, yeah. anything anything twenty five and lower is just it was really hard for me. Yeah, I mean it's all up for schools. You know, for children, schools. There's no question that hit. Yeah, there's that, as the driving instructor said, hitting someone at 20 mile an hour and hitting a, someone at 30 mile an hour is colossal change. You look oh, at yeah. 30, you're looking at death potentially. 20, there's a good chance you're going to get injured, but you'll get away with it. So, you know, that I have to put up with. But, but and for schools, I think it should be 20. I would agree. Slow down, children, young children. But once you're out, you know, I think. Um, you know, especially some some of those roads in America, that would be a great one to do, about 140, 130 down, some big straight highway. That would be fabulous. I'd love that. Oh, you you would you would love it. You, you mentioned Arizona. It's funny. When I was down in Arizona with the Air Force in 07, I rented a Dodge, 
want to see Charger. Oh. Well, no, it was, no, it was a Chrysler 300C. It was a 300C. I got it from Enterprise Rental Car. And I was going down. It's the fastest I've ever driven because he, he was in New Mexico. So I was in Phoenix driving down, you know, through Tucson. And I went down to Deming, New Mexico. And, you know, I got that thing up to about 125 miles an hour on the road. And, and that, I mean, that doesn't sound too fast, but that was really fun. Like, it, and it's so open. It's like I, I got off the one rest stop because I wanted to take a leak. And I looked to my left and there was a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. I looked to my right and there was a dirt road and there was not literally both sides. Were, I was like, why am I here? And I got back on the freeway. Cause there's, <laughs> that's how, that's how openness it is. And that's the, that's the one thing I think most Brits would love about America is just getting out in the open road. Cause like you drive two seconds in UK traffic, you guys stop, go around a park car, get over here. It, yeah. and then there's, here's another roundabout. It's uh, it's, it's nerve wracking at some point. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I've noticed there's been quite a big change in design of American cars. Many, and you know, they've come down to a smaller size. But I love them when they were big. I love the big cars, the big, big American cars. They were. I had a. What did I, have? I had a Ford Sunliner. I don't think of another one. I had a Gal Ford Galaxy. But there was another one. I had. I had several, several American cars, and they they were a different ball game. And 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 even then, they were large compared to English cars, but. Um, everyone's gone smaller now, you know. Um, I, I mean, my five liter is fairly big and damn powerful, but um, yeah, it, 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 by and large, in, in, in America, I know just I, I, you know, you see a, a lot of uh, sort of, I would probably say sensible size in a way, but why be sensible when you could drive one of those big, huge Cadillacs? You know, they oh, that were great fun. That was that was that was driving, man. That was driving. Well, it's funny because like the, ever since the, up until the seventies, they had the big cars, and then they came out with all the gas efficiency stuff and get, get rid of the leaded vehicles and all that. And that's when the cars started getting really smaller. But and then around the turn of the century, you started getting the SUVs and stuff. And now it's these pickup trucks, Marty. I got so many buddies. Like I'm stereotypical. I should have a giant, you know, Silverado or something in the driveway, or you know, Toyota Tundra or something. So many of my friends just got these gigantic pickup trucks, and it's like. Yeah, that's right. They got them in England. Yeah, I don't, it's it's like they got a hundred fifteen thousand dollar truck, and I'm over here with my my Kia. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now you've chartered in over eight decades. That's a lot of decades, bro. If I was to ask you how you keep your heart in the game, how you keep your motivational level peaking, you love touring, you love doing it. What would you tell me is the key to the success for you? I think it's just the joy of music, you know, to, I mean, um, I mentioned Beyonce early on. I never, I would never, I, when Beyonce first came out, I heard the voice, thought the voice was staggering, but had no, hadn't seen her work. But she came over here to work Glastonbury, and it was one of the most stunning shows you'd ever see in your life. And me and my wife, we, 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 we didn't know what we were going to see. We didn't know how good she was going to be. We turned it on and we could not get over it. And now and again, you know, you 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 see artists like that. You know what I'm saying? It and that kind of that's what fuels me up. Just the love of what the industry I'm in. Love seeing new talent. Love love music. And and when you when you hit the spot with someone who's really great like that, you know, uh, and Michael Jackson was like that as well. Um, yeah, and, you know, and Paul, same with Paul Simon, Simon and Garfunkel. When they did their live shows in the old days, you know, yeah, a little bit of magic, and that that drives me on. That keeps me motivated, and every day, um, I'm so lucky, I'm a lucky man to to be able to uh, be able to just switch on, uh, you know, my my big speakers and listen to music uh, from you know virtually around the world and and great styles and um, music's my my big passion. It's huge passion. That's awesome, man. So your, your website's martywild.com, right? Yes, that's right. That's All right. right. So everybody, go if you want to check out the tour dates. I'm sure they're on his Instagram and everything else, but uh, visit martywild.com. Now, is this this is just going to be in uh, England, right? I didn't notice any international dates for now. Is that correct? Yeah, no, it'll just be just be here in the UK. Only only because I'm the age I'm at now. I don't want to. I'm hesitant to fly anymore. <laughs> I did all that flying bit year after year. Probably like you, you know, you get. After a while, you think maybe I'll just keep on terra firma, you know, just keep keep my feet on the ground. So uh, it'll just be the UK, but um, 
um, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, international travel is uh, is it's a pistol. I mean, I'm in my 40s and it's uh, late 40s probably, and it's uh, it's a bitch, man. It's <laughs> go through customs and go through JFK Airport and all that. It's uh, so I wonder if you feel that. Oh my goodness gracious! Well, airports like ours, where they get queues that go miles long. You're queuing and queuing. <laughs> when, when, I, when I was coming back from visiting my buddies in the UK in uh, October 2022, I was standing at the airport. I was, it, whenever before I travel, I always sweat a lot. I was just dripping sweat. The lady comes up, she's like, All right, mate. And I was like, Yeah, I just get like this before I travel. It's <laughs> well, it's like, you know, that allows you're not, you get, you get off a plane uh, in, in the uh, Heathrow, for example, and you think, Oh, great. You know, so you've landed and you, you, you know, you're, you're going along there with your family. And then suddenly, you see this queue ahead of you. It's massive. And you're going to be in it. And you're going to be in it for at least an hour. You know, and they, they oh, God. Um, I mean, there must be a, a quicker way. Obviously, there isn't. No one's even mentioned a quicker way yet. I'm sure they will in the future to get them through. But I don't remember it being like that in the old days. But nowadays, um, it, it, it's not very pleasant. It kind of, for me, it spoils flying. Flying is lovely. Don't get me wrong. It is. Oh, I love flying. Flying is so fast. But yeah, the, I mean, there's, they're kind of, I mean, 9 11 obviously messed up a lot of it, but I mean, it just the international thing. Like, I remember I visited Ireland with my dad in 99, and it was just, hey, how you doing, stamp? And you just go through. That was it. Now it's like, especially for, and I got to, you know, throw America under the bus on this. He got my buddy uh, Craig visit from the UK last year. He came for the comedy show out we had. And, and they're just asking them all kind of, who you're here to visit? What do they do for a living? There's all these random ass questions that have nothing to do with it. If you see the guy is obviously a tourist, he's he's doing tourist stuff. Why are you giving him a hard time? Uh, yeah. uh, customs and all that. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. Maybe they can uh, figure something out with that. But Marty, yeah. thank you so much, my friend. It's been an awesome, uh, awesome time. I, I didn't hear too much about you before I had you up, but I looked you up. And, and you've been doing this for, for so long, man. It's an honor. It's been an honor, my friend. Well, it's my honor, Joe. My honor, Joe. You, you're uh, you're very American, and I like I like the American I like the American way of life. I like and I like someone who sounds American. You sound like a real. I can imagine you with a guitar and a motorbike, and imagine that, uh, your image is fantastic. My my buddy Captain Baptiste always says, "When I wear this coat, I look super American." And with the with this coat and the baseball hat and then the jerseys in the background, I'm not supposed to be playing. Uh, <laughs> you know the national anthem, but just <laughs> so I feel it. That's funny. That's great, man. Heck yeah! So now, oh, man, you have an awesome time with. Oh wait, here we got one. Uh, one more question from Shredder. It says, "What action?" <laughs> this is random. We always get random questions. This is how we do it out here. What '90s action star do you dig most, or them all? Schwarzenegger, Steven Seagal, John Claude Van Damme, or Sylvester Stallone? I like Sylvester Stallone. I liked him in the boxing films. I thought he was great. Though you know the first early boxing films he made. They were very true to life, and I thought he really, really did play the part well. Yeah, that's my vote. Rocky. And we got Angie. She says, Marty, what is your advice for being successful for someone starting over late in life? Uh, ignore your age. Just get in there and do it. Don't worry about age. Don't worry about age. You can be – You can be these these days with, with music, you could be – you can be in your 70s or older. You can be in your 70s and suddenly so come out with a hit record and be a star. You can be undiscovered. I mean, there are, pe there are people now taking these, you know, little videos that are from their camera, and suddenly you get a kid in the street, suddenly he picks up a guitar, and he's singing like, like someone you've never heard before. And a little girl, or his little girl's going to play a violin standing by the side of him, you know, and ah, they blow you away. You could be a star at any age now. So starting if you're going to start over later life, ignore your age and enjoy it. Heck yeah. All right, Marty. Appreciate it so much, sir. And uh, I don't know what the show's going to be tomorrow, but next Friday we're going to have Elio Swinton. He was an actor from the movie Varsity Blues. He'll be live at regular showtime. And uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Oh, wait, oh, we got one more. We got one more. How was working with Justin Hayward? Uh, Justin, uh, a very dear friend. We're still good friends. We meet quite regularly. Uh, great, a great singer, a great singer. And I'll tell you a story about uh, when Justin, many years ago, we formed a trio. There was my wife, myself, and Justin. And one day up in Liverpool, where, that's where Joyce's parents were born. So I, we used to stay there uh, at the house. And one day uh, Justin was there. And I, one morning I said to Justin, do you write songs, Justin? 
He said, well, yeah, I can, I can do it. I said, well, think about it and write songs. If you can do it, write songs. And we started, we started writing something. I know we did. It was something to do with the sun or whatever, you know, in those, in those, uh, those days. And then, of course, um, eventually we, we, we stayed on the road about three years. But then he, he wanted to move on and, we, and I had to move. I wanted to stop the trio and, and be single again. And, be, and he, he was fine about that. And because uh, later he was going to, you know, he was going to join that great group. So, but he, lovely man, great voice. I was listening the other day to, uh, to, to many of his tracks. Great writer and a great singer. What can I say? And a lovely man as well. That's awesome, guys. And I know we will talk to you guys later. Love you guys. Talk to me. All right, Jim.